Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 10th of September and this quick look at the week ahead uh, beginning the 13th of September with me Michael Houston. It's been a little bit of an odd week this week because while we've seen some fairly decent gains for markets in Asia the picture has been slightly more bearish when it comes to European markets while the US markets while having a slightly softer tone having come back from a long weekend, are also finding upside progress a little bit trickier to navigate. And that is obviously raising some questions about the sustainability of the current rebound or the current moves higher that we've been seeing over the course of the past few weeks. If we can start with, I'm just going to get rid of that. We're going to start with the, the, the Nikkei 225 because we've seen some fairly decent gains there over the course of the past two weeks. And um, I think one of, the, one of the reasons for that big push higher um, at the end of last week um, was the resignation of the Japanese Prime Minister and the prospect of a Japanese election. That's really given the Nikkei, which had been underperforming and has been underperforming over the course of the past few months, a really big lift um, over the past few days. We can see that in these daily candle charts here, which was Friday's strong move higher, followed uh, by the Monday move. And generally speculation that any new government will embark on a massive new fiscal stimulus program and obviously the Bank of Japan will continue what it always does and does very well um, with respect to its very loose monetary policy. So um, that's why we've seen um, the Nikkei 225 outperform over the course of the past um, few days, but we've also seen a slightly more resilient tone come from Chinese markets, albeit it has been just as just as choppy, but we have seen a little bit of a stabilization um, over the course of the past uh, few weeks as investors mull the prospect of whether or not um, we will see a further regulatory crackdown on the part of Chinese regulators. I think the key the key level for me on the Hang Seng is obviously the series of this, these two bases here uh, in and around the 24,700 24, level. Um, if I just draw in a horizontal line there, that will give us what we, what I would like to call my line in the sand for the Hang Seng, and actually probably draw in a downtrend line through these peaks here to um, get an idea of the extent of any potential rebound. And obviously, there's this, there's this peak. There's this resistance level here at 26,700, which was resistance back in August and was the key support level in July. So um, certainly fairly straightforward there. Um, China trade numbers earlier this week were much better than expected. And obviously that gives us a potential insight into this week's up and coming China retail sales numbers, um, which are due out on the 15th. We've also had to absorb a big miss on US payrolls, um, 235,000 jobs against an expectation, which was well below the lowest expectation of around about 400,000 and obviously the highest expectation, which was over a million. And now previous month, um, the previous month's report, the, the July report was upgraded to just over a million jobs from 940,000, but nonetheless, that payrolls report was very disappointing. And given the fact that it was 500,000 below expectations, um, we have to look at what the main culprit was with respect to the slowdown in hiring trends. And it was primarily in leisure and hospitality sector, which came to a shuddering halt in August. Now, there can be any number of reasons for that. Um, the Delta variant, the rise in the Delta variant was probably a key factor. Um, staff shortages still remain very much prevalent. Um, this week's jolts numbers came in at almost 11 million. Um, so there's 11 million vacancies in the US economy. Um, and yet 
um, the workforce is only 5 million people below its pre-pandemic pre level. Unemployment fell to 5.2%. So what does that mean in terms of a potential timeline for a taper? Well, it's become increasingly clear from the data, particularly in August, that the US economy has hit a bit of a soft patch um, in terms of confidence and demand. Um, that's largely as a result of the surge in Delta variant cases, which has prompted a slowdown not only um, in consumer confidence, but also in terms of traveling. Um, United Airlines, American Airlines, um, Southwest Air all reported lower booking numbers in August. Um, and September and October are also slightly um, below expectations as well. So what does this mean for the taper? Well, essentially, it probably pushes it back to the end of this year. But I think a lot will depend on the September payrolls report, which is due on the 8th of October. Now, weekly jobless claims are still falling, came in at 310,000. So that would suggest with the expiry of the additional stimulus benefit measures, unemployment benefit measures on the 6th of September, you should see a pickup in hiring trends as we head into Q4. So um, I'll certainly be keeping an eye um, on that over the course of the next few weeks. But in terms of other US data that I've got my eye on, we've got US retail sales. Now US retail sales is given the declining consumer confidence that we've seen over the course of the past month or so, it's going to be very, very key. Um, and that comes out on the 16th of September. Now, they've been very patchy this year, retail sales. Um, you know, up very strongly one month, down quite sharply the next. In June, we were expected to see a decline of 0.5%, and we ended up with a gain of 0.6. So we saw a 1.1% decline. Now, the expectations are for another decline in August, and certainly that wouldn't be a surprise given some of the other survey data that we've seen for the month of August. But we've also got the fact that um, you will have had some element of back to school spending in August, which may well have kept a floor under US consumer spending. But certainly prices are also a concern. Um, we have US PPI later on Friday, later today. Um, obviously, I don't have visibility of those numbers, but they could certainly give us an indication of whether or not price pressures in the US economy are starting to diminish because um, they have been very, very high. They've been leading indicators for a move higher in inflation. And with US CPI for August due out on the 14th of September, they could be a decent leading indicator as to whether or not CPI price pressures have started to peak. We've seen prices paid numbers in the latest ISM surveys start to come off their highs. That is encouraging. Um, but that's not really borne out by the recent PPI data. So that is a concern going forward. Um, so what, is, what essentially does that mean in terms of CPI expectations? Well, I suppose it really depends who you look at. But certainly I think the expectations are that headline CPI is going to come in unchanged from the levels that we saw in July, around about 5.3, 5.4%. And core prices are expected to remain the same at 4.3%. Now, that does seem a little bit optimistic, but that remains to be seen. In the short to medium term, we've seen a little bit of a rebound in the US dollar at the beginning of the week, but we are now starting to see that move starting to run out of steam. Um, that was Friday's payrolls report. It was pretty much priced in for a slightly lower than expected number. Um, we tried to go lower. We weren't able to. We've rallied back up towards this resistance level here, and now we're drifting back down again. The outlook for the dollar continues to look fairly uncertain. We've heard the ECB this week talking about reducing the amount of their PEP program. Just don't call it a taper because it's not, the lady's not for tapering apparently. But there is certainly, I think the ECB is certainly becoming, or having to become slightly more flexible when it comes to the size of their bond purchase program. And with the German election coming up on the 26th of September, maybe a modest taper was the least of what markets could expect. And certainly the euro has found a little bit of a bid 
around about the 118 level, as can be seen from this pullback in the dollar CMC dollar index. We can see that borne out with this euro dollar chart here. <clears throat> Daily chart finding support at the 50 day moving average and the 118 area. So we could well see euro dollar start to edge back up, but I've, I'm still of the opinion or of the mind that this 120 area, 119 initially, 120 is a big, big top, but 119.10, that's a big level. Uh, obviously, that was the highs that we saw in the wake of last week's payrolls numbers. They weren't able to take out that 119.10 area. That remains a very, very key resistance level in the short to medium term. So we need to keep an eye on that particular level. The euro has had a slightly softer theme in recent days, um, certainly against the pound. We have squeezed high. This is a four hour chart. We squeeze back to 86.10. That still remains a very, very key resistance level. Now we're below 85.50. Um, the, the current short squeeze that we've seen in Euro Sterling shorts does appear to be running out of steam. 86.10, 86.40, there or thereabouts is a decent resistance level. The next target now for Euro Sterling is 85.05. Obviously, with that in mind, and this week's disappointing GDP numbers out of the UK economy, um, attention will inevitably shift to how well the UK economy is doing um, relative to the European economy. And we've got a raft of UK numbers out um, during the week, starting with UK unemployment data on the 14th, followed by CPI data on the 15th and then UK retail sales for August on the 17th. So what, is essentially, does that, what essentially does that mean for sterling? Well, looking at this chart here, let's remove some of the clutter. I'm just going to hide the drawings there and you can see the, 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 the lines slightly more clearly. Um, the key level for me remains 139, then 140. Well, we, we found a little bit of a top anywhere through 139 here. So having held 137.25, 137.20 earlier this week, the next obstacle for a move back to 140 is this series of peaks around about 139, 138.90 there or thereabouts to take us back to the peaks that we saw then. Still very much a range trade on cable. Certainly an interesting dynamic when it comes to monetary policy early this week. An interesting revelation, if you like, from Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey when he talked about um, the, the bar for some form of normalization of monetary policy. Now, the unemployment numbers have been coming down steadily over the course of the past few months. Um, round about now 1.6 million people still on furlough. That is likely to come down even further. The big question is whether that gets added to the unemployment numbers or whether those furloughed workers who are not taken back um, fill the vacancies that are currently outstanding um, within the UK economy and certainly there is evidence of some underlying wage pressure starting to build when it comes to the UK economy as well and that's something that we really do need to keep a close eye out for going forward. Um, in terms of the unemployment numbers expecting to see another fall in the headline rate to 4.6 percent. Average weekly earnings are expected to fall back modestly from the levels they were in June, from 7.4 to 6.8 percent, as some of these furloughed workers come back into the workforce. These furloughed workers tend to be in hospitality and leisure, so that is likely to bring the average early earnings number down slightly as these lower paid um, salaried workers come back into the workforce. We've also got core CPI. Um, and CPI, and that is expected to see a big jump, big jump in August. Um, you may recall that headline CPI fell back to 2% in July. We're expecting to see a rise of 0.9% to 2.9%, and that is likely to crystallise the debate on the Monetary Policy Committee about the imminent removal of monetary stimulus. Not a rate rise, not a rate rise, but um, any normalisation or reducing of asset purchases will obviously start the 
stop the clock on a potential rate rise um, maybe sometime towards the end of next year. Core CPIs is also expected to rise quite sharply from 1.8% to 2.9% as well. So that's going to be hard for the Bank of England to ignore, particularly combined with the fact that wage pressure is also at elevated levels. Doesn't mean that we're going to get a rate hike, but certainly you think in terms of a glide path for a normalisation of policy, it moves the Bank of England closer to a normalisation than it does the ECB um, and potentially the Federal Reserve as well. In terms of retail sales on the 17th of September, which is a Friday, um, I'm hoping to see an improvement after the 2.5% decline that we saw in July. Um, that was really disappointing, came despite the full relaxation of COVID restrictions, but I think coinciding as it did with the so-called pandemic, um, that caused an awful lot of people um, to um, withdraw from more the more discretionary type of spending that tends to boost the retail sales numbers. Now, obviously, the relaxation of the pandemic restrictions on the 16th of August should give us a slightly more positive number, you would think. And certainly the expectation is that we will see a big rebound in the, well, not a big rebound, but certainly a, a decent rebound of around about 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8% after the big decline that we saw in July, particularly with the fact that we've got the school holidays, we'll have back to school spending. Um, you'll also have increased domestic spending as people holiday at home. So I'd be very surprised if we don't see a fairly decent rebound in UK retail sales going forward. And hopefully that will be a catalyst for um, a much more resilient pound sterling going forward. Um, certainly, if I draw in this line here, we've got a nice little line coming in there, which hopefully will support um, any bid tone to the pound more broadly. Um, so, covered UK unemployment, we covered CPI, we've got retail sales. We've also got, as I say, we talked about US retail sales um, for August, and that's due on the 16th of September. And as I say, that will give us a good in indication as to whether or not the falls in consumer confidence we're seeing um, in those numbers have been, are reflected in consumer spending patterns. Um, as I say, the, uh, there is an expectation of a decline of 0.7 for US retail sales, um, with US CPI expected to remain unchanged at 4.3 um, on core and 5.3 on headline. China retail sales. China's economic data, recent economic data for August, trade was actually slightly better than expected um, when you consider some of the weak PMI numbers that we've been seeing. So in terms of August retail sales, those trade numbers would appear to suggest that we could well see a much more positive number for China retail sales going forward. Having said that, um, economic expectations around that are pointing to a further slowdown to 7%, which would obviously be the weakest retail sales numbers for China this year, and a slowdown in industrial production as well, um, which is expected to rise by 4.8, 5.8%, which would be its worst performance since August last year. Higher prices are also affecting the Chinese economy. Um, we saw earlier this week that uh, China decided to release some inventory crude oil inventory from its strategic reserves, um, which caused Brent crude prices to drop quite sharply um, yesterday. They've rebounded today. Still got this trend line here, which is intact. While it remains intact, um, and the $75, the, the August peaks here around about, or the peaks here at uh, 76.60, um, I still can't get enthusiastic about a move higher in crude oil. Having said that, um, while we stay well above this 200-day moving average, then pressure is building potentially for a move higher. These dips here, away from this trend line resistance here and here, they haven't been particularly solid. You know, they haven't been particularly um, 
there's not been an awful lot of thrust behind the dip. We found fairly decent support in and around $71 a barrel. So we really need to break below $71 a barrel to signal a deeper correction towards the downside, given how the, that, that particular level has held quite substantially over the course of the past week or so. So that's um, that's uh, that's uh, Brent, Brent crude. So what else? Have, what else am I keeping an eye out for this week? Well, we've got um, some fairly important earnings announcements from UK retailers. We've got um, JD Sports, um, and we've got Ocado Group. Now JD Sports has been a standout performer this year, and absolutely um, set itself apart, hit record highs. Um, earlier this month. This is its year-to-date performance. Um, if we look at it, um, the latest trading update showed that profits before tax are on track to be coming at around £550 million. They've been on an acquisition spree as well. And obviously, the CMA have once again decided to block its foot asylum acquisition, which is, seems to be mind-bogglingly mind unfathomable, struggling to get my words out at the moment, um, given the fact that it makes up less than 5% of the, the UK footwear market. Nonetheless, I think even if they are forced to sell it off, they probably won't be able to get that much for much for it. And they only paid, they didn't really pay that much for it anyway. They've got net cash of £795 million. Pounds. So um, it's not as if they're short of a bob or two. So certainly I don't think markets are that concerned about the first half update. It's pretty well flagged. It's going to be a fairly decent one. We've got Dark Trace, an IPO that came to market earlier this year. It's performed very, very well um, over the course um, of the past few months since it was launched on the 30th of April. Um, peaked at 784 pence. It did see a little bit of a drop. Um, once the lockup period expired and some um, shareholders basically cashed in. In July, the company upgraded its full year growth forecasts. Um, full year revenue is expected to come in at $278 million, a rise of almost 40%. Client base is up 42%. So the only cloud on the horizon is obviously its involvement in its involvement with shareholder Michael Lynch, who lost his appeal against extradition to the US on fraud charges has recovered some of those losses since then, um, and that could provide an unwelcome distraction. So certainly expectations are higher in terms of its forecast for 2022 for annualized recurring revenue, and um, that uh, that that should be that should be one to watch as we look ahead to this week's earnings updates. And we've also got Associated British Foods, Primark, which isn't on there. And we've also got Ocado, Ocado Group, which has underperformed relatively this year, um, which is not surprising, really, given that at the beginning of the year it was valued almost on a par with Tesco's, given the fact that its turnover is nowhere near what Tesco's turnover is. So we've seen a little bit of an adjustment there in terms of expectations around the Ocado share price. It's below the 200-day moving average. It's finding momentum pretty difficult to sustain. Um, H1 first half total revenues saw a rise of 21.4% to £1.3 billion. This week's Q3 numbers um, will be an early indication of how well the business is shaping up with respect to its current fiscal year. Now, pre-tax losses are still um, lower than they were. They're better than they were, should I say. Um, they came in at £23.6 million in the first half. New full new fulfillment centres are coming online in the second half of the year, and Andover came back online in Q3, so they should be they should see a pickup on the back of that, and Perfleet is set to open in Q4. So certainly in terms of fulfillment centres, the picture for Ocado certainly looks better than it did, say for example six months ago, in terms in terms of overall turnover. So. Um, that's pretty much a pricey of what's coming up over the course of the next week or so. Thank you once again for listening, ladies and gentlemen. I wish you all a very pleasant weekend and I will speak to you all 
same time, same place next week. Thanks very much for listening and have a great weekend.